All right. Well, one of the ways that we can so get to that to Joseph. Okay, yes. that net zero is, is through nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions. And uh, thanks for letting me talk a little bit about that. So my name is Joseph Pallant, based here in Vancouver, and I work for Ecotrust Canada. Um, Ecotrust Canada is building <clears throat> economic alternatives for people in the places they call home. So we have a really sort of dual focus on environmental alternatives, so economic alternatives, and environment and really a big goal is helping communities take greater control of the management and say over and benefit from the resources in their um, communities and landscapes um, and one of those key pathways is through the development of carbon offsets and other pathways to carbon finance uh, enabling the deployment of natural climate solutions um, and just for reference um, I spent 14 of the last 15 years as a carbon offset developer, so that's really kind of been my, my kink, um, and wrote, was part of the team that wrote the world's first Kyoto CDM reforestation methodology back in 04, um, wrote the world's first ISO 14064-2 reforestation methodology for Air, Bart here and his team at Air Ecosystem Restoration Associates, and that issued over a million tons of ex ante reforestation carbon credits at a period in time when we could count, uh, have a carbon credit count the long-term 100-year benefit of that activity. Um, that ship has sailed and is no really l longer available in our current space and reality, but did a lot of important work towards paving the pathway to understanding how implementation of these natural climate solutions um, yield carbon benefit. Um, and then it's also been really neat over the last year and a bit with Ecotrust Canada to expand my work from carbon project development and working with communities um, to also trying to build some new pathways to drive resources into nature-based solutions, into activities that have a real provable carbon impact that can't be quantified and monetized through offsets. I did not include really much of any of that in my talk today because that's a whole other ballgame, um, but happy to ask, answer questions about that. All right, so the role of natural climate solutions. Um, it's valuable to put natural climate solutions in context. They've kind of blossomed to be this big thing over the last, say, 18 months or so. Um, it's been really nice to have the hype come back around for people who've been in this space for a long time. Um, and as one might imagine, you kind of sharpen your stick around um, debating with people from environmental NGOs to other people in the carbon offset space to people who are more in clean energy or whatever around why should we even be engaging in natural climate solutions? Isn't this just distracting from the real issue of an energy transition? And I, I imagine some of those debate points might be valuable for people in this room as well as you move forward in using these, these tools. So there was a UN special report issued in 2000 that showed that a full third of human-made anthropogenic GHG emissions from Industrial Revolution until 1998 were caused by land use change, primarily deforestation. So that means that a third of the, the climate change problem is being caused um, by humans messing with the landscape. Um, and right now, our ongoing annual emissions from landscapes are around 20%. Why is that? It's, there's been a little bit of a uh, lessening in emissions from the landscape, but there's been a lot more emissions from fossil fuels come on since the year 2000. Um, I kind of coined this concept of a debt and deficit situation when it comes to natural climate solutions and why you want to use them. If you think of our debt as all of that extra, that third of excess um, emissions in the atmosphere is the debt um, that we've incurred through bad landscape management, um, and we have an annual deficit of around 20% of excess emissions to the atmosphere that we both need to pay down the debt by restoring landscapes, and we need to lower the deficit by improving forest management and conserving um, forests and landscapes. Um, this pairs nicely with a recent finding that about a third of cost-effective emission reductions through to 2030 are from natural climate solutions. And Katie, I don't know if you remember where that sort of is po poked out from, um, but it's sort of a take that if we're trying to get to 2030 goals, that around a third of that is also gonna come from natural climate solutions. So it's, uh, it's not a niche piece of the puzzle. Yeah, the land support in 2016. yeah, I think so. I think it's the, the UN after 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the things I also <clears throat> want to point out uh, from this sort of debate toolkit is that every single offset system in the world now allows forest carbon offsets. Um, for a while, uh, there were some that held out. The gold standard tried to hold out, and then they bought themselves a forest offset standard. Um, and it's quite profound because people also think, oh, it's this new thing coming to the forest. Like, no, it's in all of the offset systems. And I'll posit that we can't solve climate change without forests. So I want to talk about the role of a carbon offset. And I do a little bit of kind of carbon offset 101. I might skim over a, a subsequent slide to this. But I thought since we're talking about it, it just might take a little bit of an opportunity to try to dig into it a little bit more and what's really the nature of this thing. Um, so an offset is a proactive project-based emission reduction that gets or keeps carbon out of the atmosphere. And I think a lot of our talk today, I think people really get that proactivity nature of it. It has to go above and beyond business as usual. Uh, it has to be something that's being conceived of as a carbon offset. We can't say, oh, this thing's happening on the landscape. We're just going to quickly call it an offset. Um, and I really believe in carbon offsets because they drive new investment into improving emission reduction outcomes across the economy. Um, and um, Rob pointed out that um, it's, um, it's that it really democratizes, actually it's a, a later point, um, but it really democratizes the opportunity um, and, and the pressure to reduce greenhouse gases from just the big polluters, the big easy capturable polluters, into all other, you know, massive other aspects of the economy. So you've got entrepreneurs, you've got foresters, it's already been said, but I think it's really worthwhile to weigh in on is this gives tools to other people to go proactively do good stuff. And in both my work and I think a lot of the work that we're coming around this table to do today um, around driving opportunities for First Nations communities um, to be able to play a, another part in addressing climate change. Um, and pulling in resources to do that good work. Um, and it, it really drives that opportunity out much more broadly than just into the, the polluter portfolio. Um, and interestingly, it also kind of pushes the responsibility. So I think it's good for people who are not, for not just the big polluters to recognize that they have a role in addressing climate change. Sometimes people think about that like, I'm going to ride my bike or I'm going to go vegan or whatever. Um, but also that they have, you know, if we can build them toolkits to go do what they do best, including in natural climate solutions, um, and can finance that work by uh, carbon finance, um, we'll get where we're going faster. Um, and offsets are a tool to com connect emission reduction supply and demand. Um, so they're really, it's, it's a tool to connect that piece in another parlance. Next slide, please. So I think the only reason why I kept this in rather than taking it out is I wanted to really reiterate that point that we need to be really clear um, when we're talking about net zero, when we're talking about carbon neutrality, when we're talking about tradable units, that there's, you know, 20 years plus of backstory, of back pressure around the creation of these units and what does net zero mean? What does carbon neutrality mean? Um, and I, I make a point, I think, a little later on. Um, but you can't be, in, in my book, you can't be carbon neutral without offsets unless you truly are emitting nothing. So the only thing that you can bring down, whatever your emissions are, down to zero is through use of a carbon offset. Um, and these are a bunch of the pieces of the puzzle that you go through to make that um, offset, but I won't belabor. Next slide, please. So I think people can kind of imagine it, but and this is not an exhaustive list, but just to sort of lay it out there, different types of natural climate solutions projects. Um, and I didn't cover waste. We talked about offsets in the Canadian federal system. They're also including waste, but sort of outside of the natural climate solutions frame. Um, we really have forests, grasslands, and soils, which I've kind of lumped agriculture, and then wetlands. So once again, I've sort of done it in a natural climate solutions framework rather than a offset um, silo framework. Um, but uh, in forests, there's sort of, I think, three different... And Joseph, just so uh, to be clear, yeah. NCS, NBS, right, 
this has been a core pillar to a lot of it. Like you had an entire day or a couple of days on um, on this with FMCI. Is that mm -hmm. that right? That's when Jamie first got brought in. Okay. Yeah. Right. So just to be, they, they're had. This is obviously not news. Discussions today, but uh, yeah, I don't think a lot of this is like news news. Yeah. But um, I think it is important to sure. get so we're all on the same page about some of that clarity around the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd say the key a key thing that I think is useful for digging further into the space is realizing, like with forest as an example, there's the restoration of forest, so through afforestation or reforestation, that's putting trees back on the landscape, which is distinct in the carbon crediting pathways a lot of the time from the other two, which is improved forest management and forest conservation. So forest conservation is obvious, just keeping forests or other um, carbon stock standing. That one's also kind of clear. The improved forest management one is um, something that gets varying amount of, of love and understanding, but it's actually fascinating because what you have in, in improved forest management, IFM, is really taking a look at how we manage forests today, how logging companies do their work, how that whole sector works, and saying, hey, if we can add another value stream to your operations, which is keeping more carbon out of the atmosphere than would have happened in the baseline, um, I think that a fulsome uptake of, of this type of project and this type of thinking could actually lead to a lot of carbon value and a lot of reduced emissions in Canada. Um, and it, it can happen without as big of a paradigm change of, well, we're just going to put our line around this and we're going to protect this and not cut it down, or, well, we're going to cut, we're going to plant trees. Um, so I, I think it's a really interesting one and I think it's great for uh, it's nice to get to talk about it in this space and have you think about it. Um, next slide, please. Selecting carbon offsets. I think we, we've also covered a lot of this today around how do people assess the quality and value of offsets. Clearly, if it's eligible for compliance into a Canadian federal system, um, we're going to have a strong likelihood of value. Also, if we have eligibility to trade into the Canadian system and through their carbon neutral public service, um, we're gonna, we have um, a clear path to value. Um, the the uh, only things I throw in there that maybe are not obvious is um, vintage. And so vintage just refers to what year were those offsets issued. Um, and uh, newer is generally better than older only because people will often put um, sort of eligibility end dates um, to their work. So let's say, okay, well, we're only going to allow things from 10 years back or five years back or whatever. Um, but I don't think anything crazy in there. It's quite important, just for the federal context, when we talk mm. about the federal system and the federal system, the federal um, offset system that's under development and recognized units, including for British Columbia, right? I mean, there are, and, you know, Alberta, like there are a number of units that are in the Alberta system or in BC system that simply won't be eligible in the federal system for a few reasons, but including on the, the vintage. Yeah. Date, right? so, and it, it closely dances with project start date. And so it's even, it's a subset of that. In this case, the federal government system, in my understanding, is saying that we will only allow projects, mm -hmm. we will only allow credits. Um, be they under the provincial systems or our new federal system that has started after the date of, I think, the issuance of the Pan-Canadian framework um, on climate change. So they are, and this is actually falling in the subsector of additionality, um, but it's, it's a subsector and this may be getting a little bit too down the geekery path. Um, so usually additionality is financial additionality. There are other pathways, but could this have happened in absence of, um, of the carbon value? The other subset, which I think is more a stroke of a pen risk-esque, is sort of arbitrary saying, okay, um, maybe this project couldn't have gone ahead without carbon value, um, but it, it started before we started our system, so we're not allowing it. So I think it's one of those less defensible, um, more arbitrary ways of, of setting guideposts, whereas most of the other ones I like a lot. <laughs> but it, it did really come into play in the, um, the Great Bear Rainforest um, uh, well, I guess this last purchase, um, and then there was an article in the Narwhal and the Walrus a little while back um, <coughs> about, you know, that these haven't been sold, so it's good to see that they did get sold. Next slide, thanks. Um, so there is a lot of text, my apologies. Um, but just for talking a little bit about using carbon offsets, and maybe some of this will be valuable in this discussion around FNCI and, and 
what's on the table here. So using and reporting voluntary offset use is usually pretty simple. Um, sometimes there are rules around what can be used or how it needs to be registered based on the offset standard or use regime. Use of compliance offset systems is usually design is usually driven by and governed by the design of the pertinent um, climate regulatory system. So in Canada, we are going to have the um, open race pricing system um, and sort of the overarching pan Canadian framework, and that'll have rules for how you can use offsets um, to meet your compliance. Um, I think as this is still all moving and these systems are different around the world, different in different provinces, they change with legal rulings and with government changes. I just say that I think if you're not paying close attention to eligibility requirements, you're going to get burned and AKA be made sad as I'd, I'd put it earlier. Um, I got the most laughs I've gotten in a long time. Um, it's uh, and I think it's really pertinent in this discussion as we sort of start to toe into ITMOs. Um, Alex, I really like what you were saying around you guys are drawing frameworks and boundaries for where you want to be achieving your net neutrality. Um, and I think that that's a really, that clarity, that's a good approach. And um, just making sure that your, your unit is, is fit for the use you need it for. Um, as I just said a, a couple minutes ago, it's my position, and I would say carbon market industry standard, that you can only use offsets to counterbalance emissions, and hence it's generally a must for net zero. Um, so I recognize this is partly me making a, you know, an assertion that you need offsets to offset your emissions to get to net zero. People could take a different approach. You could have regulations say that's fine. You could just make a good case for it and have better PR, um, but I, I think it's, important to, to recognize that, that what offsets are is therefore offsetting emissions and they're packaged and created for that use. Um, and really that tradable unit disposition is paramount. Um, and so as the day has gone on, I'm starting to understand what you guys are working on a little bit better, but I think just really making sure that, and I think the broader discussion around British Columbia LNG um, and aspirations of capturing that carbon value as it's shipped overseas, um, just really being clear that you can use whatever credits you're getting for the purpose that you're intending and being at a, a voluntary net zero or maybe as we get some years down the road, compliance in a federal cap and trade system or compliance in a federal system that is very serious about meeting its 2030 targets, that whatever you're buying is, is usable into that system. Um, and I don't know if we have a lot of time to discuss it right now, but I was curious, you know, is my statement around only offsets can get you to net zero, is that um, contentious? Do people generally buy that? Do people have any other positions? Um, just curious if anybody's got a hot take on that, either in support or in opposition. What else would you use? Uh, you could say, well, we planted two billion trees, and so surely that's got enough carbon out of the atmosphere to... to so you're just bypassing the verification. Yeah. No, no, no. So, no, I was wondering, Joseph, could you, could you, like an offset, we're always talking, it's had to have happened, right? And sorry, it could have been in the past, could have been just today, but it had to have happened. And couldn't we, is there an offset that talks about things that will happen? And, and this is the problem with trees, is that it will happen. Front end loaded in cost and back end loaded in carbon. I was thinking, well, if these guys want to say they're neutral, but they're buying something that's going to happen 10 years from now. Just like something that happened 10 years ago, they could buy that. You know, it happened in 2010 or whatever the expiry dates were. So why couldn't you buy something that's going to happen in 10 years as your offset? And that's what trees are. You mean like create a futures market for forest offset? And it's verified. Did you plant that seedling? Do you have a... Uh, do you have a track record that it grows to this height over this time and absorbs that? Yeah. And, and it's been done. It's been done. Yeah, it, a lot of it in Australia. So, so a lot of those. You're talking about a forward purchase, and yeah. someone will factor that uh, revenue stream 10, 20 years out. Oh, back but they'll they give me credit for that ton today. Yeah. Well, they might pay you for it. Yeah. It's a question of whether you can claim it today. 
system. Well, it's different claiming it after. We want to claim interest. zero LNG. Zero. There's a finance. There's a set so, of financial so instruments that will allow you to yeah. do that. You can get paid for it, then go out and buy the stuff today. You probably have to get it insured. There's there's a couple of answers to this, and a lot of it comes back to what rules are you needing to comply with um, and are there any or are you making your own um, and then keeping in mind you can do that but you also want to guard for reputational risk of people shooting holes in it um, and also for even having ammunition that they've used before to do that exact same task um, so the work that um, Bart and I did together um, was a really good example of how you definitely like you can plant trees and have carbon benefits accrue over time. So this project was working in um, parks and regional district areas in the lower mainland um, to go and clear out a lot of the time blackberry bush um, or other invasive species um, and plant a mix of site mixing, uh, site matching um, native tree species that would eventually grow and overtop the blackberries and the other invasive species. Does anybody know the one way to get, other than planting a tree that will overtop it and shade it, the one other way to get um, blackberries out of your backyard? Move. Um, so the goal was with these is to be able <laughs> is to overtop this. Anyway, could go on forever about that, but I think the key point was we, you know, we're planting in sight of here. So we have you know, strong rule of law, strong ability to go and check that these trees were there, um, 40 years of tree planting experience and excellence in ensuring that those trees can be planted, established, and tended, and really good tools around forestry science. You know, forestry and scientific forestry is 100 plus years old. We have really good skill set and ability to understand what's going to happen when we plant that tree and how to take net downs for risk take net downs for unintentional, um, uh, unintentional um, reversals. And then also even in take net downs for, well, we think it's gonna grow like this, but we'll do here to be conservative. And so under that, we were able to use the ISO 14064-2 standard to really create the, the protocol and the project plan, if people were paying attention to the slide that I skimmed over, um, and show that we would have these real carbon outcomes from this forest over time and we could be really sure about that but the one key issue is is the timeliness or temporality of those emission reductions and where we've come to today definitely in the compliance space um, and interestingly as compliance has taken on more of the oxygen of what is the carbon market you can only use an existing emission reduction outcome to pair against your now current emission and so um, that's what's current. Is it like today, or is it this year, or is it this decade? Well, th with the emission reduction outcome, it, it has to have already been hap happened and been proven for you to get issued that unit, um, and then you can apply that to your um, emissions as they come down the pike. Um, so once again, I'd, I'd say that this is kind of it's my opinion to a certain extent, and how it works in the compliance systems. I, I, I don't think that there's any debate around that. How that works in the voluntary um, is a little bit up to you. But what I would say is having been through the trenches on this stuff and had a lot of hard learned lessons, there's already big targets on our back around offsets. A lot of people still don't like carbon offsets. They don't like commodifying nature. Um, they don't like letting the big polluters off the hook. So you need to be able to bulwark and defend that. And people, a lot of people don't like natural climate solutions. And I wouldn't let the sort of awesome last 18 months of bloom and excitement around this um, uh, confuse you to a lot of deep underlying enviro movement and even people in the energy space and renewable energy really don't like natural climate solutions. So I would say, I would personally, if you were asking me, say bite off those two things to defend. Don't bite off the third, which is saying, oh yeah, we can prove that this carbon emission reduction is gonna happen in the future, but it hasn't happened yet. I think the only counter to that that I'm thinking of, A, we keep talking about targets at 2030, but we won't accept something that delivers on that 2030 time frame. It did, yeah. Well, you can, ex so. so. create an obligation today that 
that, and you don't discount it. Like you get into a financial world and it'll be discounted like heck, Paul. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to make any difference. That's just people trading money. But if you can say, if you, yeah, this is like we're perfect and round. If you, if you don't discount that credit, you say, look, I've got an obligation today, and I'll give you something that's going to happen in 2030. We'd be a lot better off with this nature based solution because it takes that long. Or plus. No. Or you can make the voluntary commitment net zero by 2030. Right. Or you don't even say just uh, net zero. Yeah. You just, you've got a 2030 yeah. to back up. So, but I think it's the other world. It's not just the voluntary. It's how do you mm -hmm. get that future look into a compliance world. That's what I'd be. Uh, well, I, I will say that. Well, we that. haven't talked about it. <laughs> Really, uh, but it, I think it's critical to understand in the like Ottawa federal context right now is this we are this government is looking at enhancing its current 2030 target right that so enhancing that current right now 2005 right it's 30 percent below 2005 levels by 2030 well we have a pretty clear indication that this country is looking to enhance that right and also net zero legislation, it's coming, right? Net zero legislation, that longer term target. What we did not have back when that target under the conservative government was first established, put forward to the UN, right? This is a legacy from the Harper government and you know the liberals kept that 2030 target. There was no consultation, right? Um, for better or worse, but there was no a thoughtful consultation around that target with various communities, business, First Nations, cities, provinces, right? Um, it's a different day now though, right? Um, and so do expect a lot of thoughtful engagement with various groups, including provinces and other communities, businesses as well, right? Certainly First Nations, Indigenous, you know, um, around the enhanced target pathways and opportunities to actually pragmatically get there and also the net zero discussions. So again, the, the timing of this is really, really good. Yeah. I think as it relates to the natural climate solution, so to, to your point about can I pre-purchase and can someone guarantee you get into this issue of is there a risk that they won't be generated? But the other aspect that hasn't been touched on around natural climate solutions, to Aaron's point about getting down to the molecule level, level is what is the cost of quantifying those reductions? So you hear a lot about regenerative agriculture, right? Or you hear a lot about soil sequestration, but at fifty dollars, thirty dollars a ton, it's just not cost effective to measure that, right? In a in a manner that allows us to create those credits going forward. This is again where the, the governments that are creating these frameworks need to find different ways potentially or to quantify those soil the removals, the sequestration in the soil, whether it be for forest, wetlands, or, or agriculture, or we need to have uh, new technology that allows us to make those, those, uh, sorry. Every time you talk, you can <laughs> I know. Yeah, you. The market's are The carbon market's are Or, uh, anyways, to, to make sure they're cost effective, right? Yeah. So I think, again, looking at the clock, um, this has been hopefully really great. Joseph, are you? Uh... Um, I think I'm almost there. Um, so yeah, uh, I told you a bit about us. Um, this is some of our jam. Um, and You're based in Vancouver, this guy. Right? Yeah. 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 And I, I, I think I'm such a big fan of natural climate solutions and carbon offsets because I've got to see these tools used right to do really great things on the landscape. We have the Chequemus Community Forest Offset Project up around Whistler where we supported the Squamish Nation, Lil Watt Nation, and the Resort Municipality of Whistler to agree on how to manage this forest and do it in a way where they could have better landscape outcomes and make more money from the carbon than they were making from the logging. Um, we're working on a project in Northeast Superior as well on a tenure to support Six Nations in having a bigger say to add a stick to their constitutionally guaranteed right to um, be consulted to also add carbon market value to what they're proposing 
which meets the priorities for their for their goals for the landscape. Um, there's also been people who've done or tools that have been used less well, and so I also recognize that. But it can be done well. I think we're on a really good path in Canada right now for this, and I would say just keep sticking to the high quality tools and pathways, um, and we can create a really good reality for natural climate solutions and for their use in rural resource dependent and indigenous communities to make real positive change in Canada. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joseph. Again, yeah, and you're at home, this is your hometown. You're right down the street. Um, I, I'm gonna pass it back to Paul very quickly to talk about some of, and now you have the full day um, of you know, discussion, questions uh, behind us. Um, some of your thoughts, again, from that investor perspective, the financial perspective, um, and I, then it's uh, really Alex, you and Ron to take us home. Wrap it up. Yeah. All right, five minutes. I will speak. I will speak from the perspective, if I can, of of the large private sector investor space, pension funds, very large capital pools, hedge funds, that kind of space. So remarks. Uh, within that uh, perspective. Those folks are really, uh, the, the question is, is why have, why have the very large amounts of capital that should have been moving into low carbon not moved into low carbon up to now? And in my opinion, two, two fundamental reasons. One set of reasons are structural reasons and then risk on a, on a modeled uh, basis. Structural reasons, one, uh, these kinds of projects, uh, the ticket size is just too small. The ticket size is just too small. Infrastructure funding, large project finance, uh, the big capital pools, if you're less than $200 million, don't even, don't even talk to me. So very, very difficult. The one perhaps exception to that are some large entities that are seeking what, what are called natural hedges. So if you're a large emitter, you have a large power load, that power load comes from largely fossil fuels. What do you do? You can go out and invest in a wind farm in Europe. Make money on carbon while you're spending money somewhere else. So there's some of that kind of money that's available, but again, very large ticket sizes is, is what the uh, large private sector space is looking at. For smaller projects or for smaller pools of projects, call it for argument's sake in the 50 to 200 million range, Investors want to see a path to a billion dollars. They do not want to give anybody, and I'll say that uh, prescriptively, they don't want to give people $50 million unless they can see a path to spending a billion. And, and they want that path locked up. Um, and so that, that can get you those smaller amounts of capital for smaller pools. For the very small projects uh, ver or infrastructure, it is extraordinarily difficult to extract funding from those traditional large capital pools. It's virtually impossible to do that. The other reason, so ticket size, one reason. The other reason is the perception and the reality, if, if I can put it that way, of, of what's called binary risk. And that's what we chatted about, the revocation risks, although the statistics are impressive. If you talk to people, it scares the crap out of them that the government could come to you three years after you have put your money in and said, I'm very sorry, uh, got to do it all over again. That, that just, whether there's a tiny example of that, they project out to, well, if they did it once, they're going to do it again. They could, they could do it a million times. Binary risk, stroke of the pen risk, really, really scares off capital. Up to now, uh, so that's point number two. Up to now, risk-adjusted returns in the carbon market have not been high enough. At carbon prices south of 20 to $30, when you do all the math, the risk-adjusted returns that large capital pools require, it's just not been there. When you get to the 30 to $50, things can get very interesting because while prices are seen to be doing this, the 30 to 50, capital costs are actually coming down for many of these projects. So the capital cost to do things, technical innovations, new materials, all of the kinds of stuff you've been uh, reading and hearing about are driving capital costs down. So, but in the past, that has not been the case, that 
the balance between capital in and returns out have not generated the risk-adjusted returns in the 15 to 20 percent range, and I'm not talking venture investors. I'm talking, I'm talking uh, investors in commercial commercial entities that they're looking for. And don't get me started about if you go beyond Canada or the United States and into places like Mexico and Colombia, the country risk premiums can get extraordinarily high. And so that's point number three, risk-adjusted returns. The other thing uh, that I would offer as a view uh, and from a lot of the conversations I've had from these large capital pools is they do not understand carbon. They don't actually want to understand carbon. They want to understand your investment thesis in terms they get. So you talk jargon to them and you're shown the door very, very, very quickly. So this has all got to be translated into their terms if you expect them to give you money. And I would posit for government, it's much the same thing. Government has its own language and, and traditions and all of that. You have to speak it in their language, otherwise very difficult. The other point, uh, the last point there is these, this carbon market stuff is what many investment professionals call alternative investments. It's not, and, and just think about that word, it's alternative to what? It's alternative to things we know well. And so implicit in that there is bias and it's taken pension funds a very long time and I can tell you some very creative restructuring or structuring of these deals to even allow them to do alternative investments such as a wind farm. This is very, very hard for them to do, to get through. So structural reasons. Then to a point Alistair has, has made, the other piece is risk, is, is what the risks you can model. Uh, large capital pools don't even talk to them about technology risk. They do not, if there's any sniff that this stuff is not proven, but any number of times in commercial reality, they walk away very quickly. And then there's delivery risk. We talk about advancing credits created 10 years from now. What is the probability that, that you, the buyer, or the investor in an entity that's creating these will ever see your money is, is a very tricky and difficult thing to do. That, those risks are formed from the counterparty risk, the project risk, the project carbon risk, things like leakage and baselines, and, and regulatory risk, the traditional kinds of regulatory risk. So very, very difficult. Um, one final, final point to a point Rob made and, and a point Alistair made, there, there is emerging now uh, in, in the corporate or, or in, in the finance world capital pools. So these are pools of capital that have at their heart diversification across project types. So classic example is what, is what you're saying, Rob, is you've got, you've got an, an afforestation project, capital here, tons way out here. Capital pool will pair that with a landfill that'll generate you tons now and the tons go away. To your point, you've got to smooth out the carbon offset delivery curve and the capital curve. If you can smooth those two things out, magic can happen. And at first, I would argue, uh, First Nation institutions and, and potential is, is a classic for that because you can pair, you can pair a fuel switch with a forestry conservation project, with an afforestation project, with an energy efficiency project. On paper, you can do it. Just try herding those cats. It's, it's very difficult. But capital pools are one way to arguably do that. So in terms of your policy options, what about creating a capital pool that is directed towards bundling these, these kinds of, of projects up? Because that is something that is beginning to, to emerge, the so-called carbon funds that can provide those pools of capital. So again, structural reasons and reasons of just flat out risk that up to now, uh, the, the pricing in the carbon marks has not been sufficient to generate the returns that these large capital pools need. Optimism for the future as prices go up, 
and technology drives capital costs down, but we'll see how much money gets raised. We, we have a lot of intentions out there, Mr. Fink, Black Rocks of the world, a lot of large capital pools, pension funds in Europe, a lot of talk, not a lot of money flowing in. Yet, but they're asking a lot now, not a couple of days go by, and there yep. aren't questions coming they're in. They're talking today. more, for sure. They're talking more, for sure. And that's... And they're applying with, more pressure on cor yeah. other corporations that they lend money to. Or Absolutely, money the whole ESG right? movement, the whole all of that. CFD, uh, so yeah. there's a lot of the enablers that are starting to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Thank well, that, that's an interesting idea, capital pool versus selling a bunch of offsets. It should be. We're thinking about Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be a different way to structure. It's something they have in DFO, just like to, as a coincidence that I would know, is a complementary measure for a proponent. I mean, it's a regulatory requirement. But a proponent could go in and choose offsetting programs and then um, initiate, LG Canada was the first to do it actually, initiate a complementary measure where you dump um, a lump sum of money, 10% of the project value into a fund that mm -hmm. um, Canvas is actually working on, and it's to study uh, Ulukin. But I see this as something kind of similar. I don't know how you'd function it, though, because it doesn't have a regulatory trigger, but I think that that model might be useful to create something similar. Interesting. I heard of that, uh, that concept, and you'll, you'll laugh at this, a number of years ago, Thyssen Krupp, uh, the big manufacturer of submarines. If you wanted to sell a submarine in Korea, you had to take a fraction of the capital cost and put it to offsetting the inevitable bad things that come with uh, building submarines. Uh, and it was a material amount, it was a three or four percent, a huge capital pool that had to go to certain uses, education, local initiatives, yada, yada, yada. An offset, but not carbon. It's the same as, I'd say it's well. They still get credit for it through the, through the vehicle program. They still get the actual, yep. forget the three showings, but they still get credit for doing the, the complementary measure. I think this is a lot like the ERA fund in Alberta um, and even like discussions around giving some of, I forget what it's called, but giving some of the carbon tax back um, to emitters. I think it's sort of a similar thing where there's money raised you know, on a carbon tax, there's money raised in Alberta through a system, and they just have a chunk of money, and hopefully it's going to achieve some outcomes. And it's allowed to achieve outcomes, I would say, often on not an apple, on an apples and oranges basis, where you might be putting in your money um, based on. <clears throat> so, for example, if you were to displace, um, actually, that's the wrong way. Um, but basically, uh, if your carbon tax money is like thirty-five dollars. Um, but then you put that into the like tech fund, for example, it's not going to, it's often, and it's not forced to reduce one ton of carbon dioxide. Um, so there's sort of that risk about how that money gets spent. Um, is it getting more than, a, more than the tonnage that it was displacing or less? Um, but I think it's definitely a tool that's in place and may continue to have a role. Well, it's, it's interesting because Alex, if we go back 20 years or a long time, we thought that you could get um, carbon offsets to help pay for the Great Bear Rainforest conservation, right? Like there was a revenue stream. But in the end, we ended up going to a capital fund because of course that was 20 years ago and you couldn't do that. But, but there might be some lessons from history there. Mm. There's always lessons from history. <laughs> and there's a lot of, you know, scars from those around the room and beyond who have gone through it so hopefully others can avoid it and only you know look at the best practice speaking of I'm not saying you're old okay <laughs> i just want to ask yes. a question um paul or others may may answer or just comment on it and uh, i don't know if there's a, a linkage here or not but uh, a number of the speakers um with FNCI, like say Chris Batai, um, have emphasized that this kind of scenario that we're working on um, is really a stepping stone as opposed to uh, an outcome. Um, and what they're talking about is, as I understand it, building the renewable electrical infrastructure 
renewable energy infrastructure, including the transmission, that would um, uh, electrify the economy in the future, like an important Prince Rupert that's a port of the future that's not a huge emitter of GHGs, but it's consistent with a, a net zero economy globally. Um, so we're talking 30 years from now when we're supposed to be at net zero. Um, and the, the financing is uh, obviously a challenge. And so the BC Hydro's a, a assessment of the cost of the, if we were to go with AC lines to electrify any of these scenarios, you're looking at around $3 billion in transmission infrastructure. So that doesn't, that doesn't include the renewable generation sources, whether that's wind and Ron Monk's an expert in this is going to be talking about it tomorrow. Um, those are incremental on top, but if they've got a market being the pipes and the plants and other things, uh, then presumably it makes sense to build them. But from a financing perspective, um, what we've been led to believe so far is that the only source of those kinds of funds are public sources. So the government of Canada or the government of British Columbia under their MOU, they have this mm -hmm. green MO, green electricity MOU. They put six hundred and eighty million dollars in, well, put another three billion in and and build the infrastructure for that not only the current economy, the current investment that will be associated with net z net zero LNG production, but also that future economy which would be, you know, hydrogen and splitting methane into hydrogen and carbon product and all that kind of stuff that Chris talks about. So from a long-term investment perspective, you know, the kinds of pools of investment that you're talking about, which don't necessarily rely upon high rates of return in the short term, they're more kind of, you know, transmission infrastructure type stuff. Any yeah, and that's the right ticket size. The right. fundamental problem is, is that the public shareholder has to want to split the deal up and allow the private sector to come in and make the kinds of returns they will still want, i.e. non-zero, uh, over that long period. But those large infrastructure projects are... That, that's what that, made me think that's, about it. That's, that's what people want, but it, it's all in how you do the, the public-private partnership that, underli that underlies that and will you, will you allow or will they allow the private sector to make those kinds of returns? But you go out that far and you go that big, no one is looking to get 15% uh, on their money anymore. Those right. things are single digit returns. Uh, the, the very large wind farms that are they're flipping, the very large solar farms that are flipping are all going for sub 10 rates of return on the basis that this is 30, 40, 50 years. Pension funds, ideal for that if they could if they can go in, and that's why you're seeing some of the Canada Pension Plan and OMERS and people like that getting into that space if they can. So that's where a capital fund comes Or the, the lamented uh, Canadian Infrastructure Bank. Well, yeah, exactly, or, but anyhow, it's interesting. Ron looks like he's going to say something. <coughs> well, I'm talking on this tomorrow, but, um, I mean, it's got me thinking about how you how you finance the transmission infrastructure. Um, I mean, there's a massive uh, wind resource uh, in Hackett Strait. Nikoon. Um, well, Ni beyond Nikoon, um, Ni Nikoon times ten, um, and so that if you if you look at the transmission infrastructure as enabling access to market for that one of the best wind resource, offshore wind resources in the world, it changes, maybe changes the way you look at it. But is that part of the scenario? Are you are look, actually looking at finan finance, financials, different, pro like de-risking instruments, like different kind of financial enablers uh, as part of the FMCI scenarios? Well, they're the, uh, if you want to electrify, you have to electrify going to get anywhere close yeah, to net zero. So the, the yeah. money though, like where the money is going to come from. And then people say, well, where's the money going to come from? Are you going to get $3 billion? <laughs> well, it's, yeah. But it, it's, it's fun. So there hasn't, 
Maybe our first answer was, tomorrow. well, if the Liberal government can buy a $7 billion pipeline, we can build it. This is like, like, well, $630 <laughs> million, and then ask for $3 billion. Well, they only paid 3.5. Well, so that's still more, more than the transmission. Anyway, tongue-in-cheek, but the, the point is that yeah. governments spend money on infrastructure to stimulate the economy. So yeah, maybe you've got a better idea. Paul was making was that private investors will also spend money. Right, that's why I asked the question. Get it set up. On a long term basis. Well, take the front end risks away, right. which is what governments are good at. Yeah. That's where you have a lot of these. The revenue, and it's like billions of dollars, the revenue coming in from these carbon pricing programs globally, whether it's a cap trade system or a carbon tax, a lot of the smart governments use it in order to really de risk. No, like, <laughs> don't record. But a lot of the governments are looking to how can we use that? relatively small money in the world of like, we're, we need to get to the trillions to decarbonize, we're not talking billions, trillions, and a lot of that will be private sector money. How can we use that money in order to then spark, leverage the big private capital money? And that's, you know, through into mitigation and resilience, right? And actually the resilience part, the adaptation piece, that that's that can be particularly challenging, right? Um, so yeah, it's, so like the world of like green bonds and you know you, there's a really a lot of fascinating, um, it's more than fascinating like critical models that should be looked at out there right now as like possible models to consider here. And I mean BC, I'm looking at Chris, but um, I know the BC government is already in many like around that green financial you know product world green bonds and stuff is already quite far. Green 